guest on Inside the Athlete's Mind is Shannon Miller. Shannon is a wife, mother, Olympic gold medalist, and cancer survivor. Shannon Lee Miller, born March 10, 1977, is a former artistic gymnast. She was the 1993 and 1994 World All-Around Champion, the 1996 Olympics Balance Beam Gold Medalist, the 1995 Pan Am Games All-Around Champion, and a member of the gold medal winning Magnificent Seven team at the Atlanta Olympics. The winner of a combined total of 16 world championships and Olympic medals, Shannon ranks as the most decorated gymnast, male or female, in U.S. history. She was also the most successful American athlete by medal count at the 1992 Barcelona Games. When Shannon was four months old, her physician discovered that her legs were not growing properly. He recommended that she wear a brace. In the summer of 1986, she went to a training camp in the Soviet Union. Until then, she was doing gymnastics just for fun. But after returning from the Soviet Union, she began training in earnest. She also began competing at the local level. By the end of the season, she won the state championship. Despite her heavy training schedule, Shannon was an excellent student. Her grade point average was 4.0. About four months before the 1992 Olympics, Shannon dislocated her elbow and chipped a piece of bone off during practice. She had surgery to reattach the bone. She missed only one day of practice due to the procedure. At the Olympics in Barcelona, Spain, Shannon won silver medals in all around and the balance beam, bronze in uneven bars and in the floor exercise. Shannon continued competing and preparing for the 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta. At those Olympics, she helped the U.S. women's team earn a gold medal in team competition and she earned another gold medal in the balance beam. Her accomplishments in the sport of gymnastics have won her several major honors. She has been named to USA Gymnastics Hall of Fame, the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame, the International Gymnastics Hall of Fame, and the Women's International Sports Hall of Fame. Shannon is the only woman in any sport to be inducted into the United States Hall of Fame twice. In 2003, she graduated from the University of Houston. Later that year, she entered Boston College Law School and graduated in 2007. In February 2011, Shannon revealed she had been diagnosed with germ cell ovarian cancer after doctors discovered a baseball-sized cyst. The cyst was surgically removed. Shannon underwent three cycles of chemotherapy and her doctor gave her a clean bill of health. Shannon is currently president of Shannon Miller Lifestyle and president of the Shannon Miller Foundation, which is dedicated to fighting childhood obesity. She also wrote a free ebook titled Competing with Cancer that is available at shannonmillerlifestyle.com. All told, Shannon Miller has won 59 international medals, over half of them gold, 49 national medals, over half of them gold, seven Olympic medals, two gold, two silver, one bronze, nine world championship medals, over half of them gold. She remains the only American to win consecutive world all-around titles. Inside the Athlete's Mind is thrilled to welcome Shannon Miller. And then let's start at the beginning. So where were you born? I was born in Rolla, Missouri. I grew up in Oklahoma. I have an older sister, Tessa. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of um, kids that I talk to and even their parents, they think, oh, I had this dream of being an Olympian from the time I was born. And um, for me, it was just trying to keep up with my older sister. I wanted to be like my big sis, and that's all I wanted in the entire world. And so we um, had some dance classes when we were like, around, maybe I was around four years old. And um, and then she decided one day she wanted to do gymnastics, which I had never heard of, I'd never seen, um, had never seen the Olympics on television or anything like that. But hey, if she wanted to do it, then that's where I was at. <laughs> wow, wow. Did she stay with it for an extended period of time? She stayed with it for a little bit, but uh, my sister loved so many different sports. She went on to swimming and horseback riding and cross country and track, and, and she was just a really great athlete. And I was kind of one of those that, I just really liked the gym. I kind of I found my bearings. I was extremely, extremely shy growing up. So um, being in the gym for me was, um, I don't know, this this ability to slip on a leotard and become someone else. And when I was out there tumbling around or trying to learn new things, I was just in my own little world. And I didn't have to worry about talking to anyone or looking at anyone. I just was doing my thing. And I think that was a really big comfort to me. Wow. Wow. That's Wow. Did, did your dad, were you close to your father? 
Yeah, yeah. My my father and I are, are very close. Uh, well, my mom and I are very close as well. But my dad, um, he he was um, a teacher. He's a professor of physics, and um, so he had a little bit more leeway with his schedule. So he was usually the one that was driving me to all the practices and helping me with homework on the way to and from practice and all of that. Wow, that's good. And your mother, how about you? Were you're close to her. Was she involved in encouraging you in gymnastics? Has she been a gymnast or anything? No, no, she had never been a gymnast. And what was funny is I, I would come home, um, you know, talking this foreign language. Oh, hey, mom, I've, I've learned this type of somersault or this Tkachev. And, and she wanted to understand more about what I was talking about. So she actually started coaching in the evenings. She had a full time job, uh, vice president of a bank and um, decided to do some coaching in the evening. Not not of me, but of some of the uh, some of the kids so that she could understand what this gymnastics thing was all about. And she eventually became a judge and started judging on the weekends and um, and really became involved so that she could kind of speak the language with me. Wow. Well, that's my wife. I think she's doing the same thing with football and my son. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. What now? Uh, let me jump ahead a bit. What took you ultimately? What took you or what pulled you to Boston College? Uh, well, lost school. Um, it pulled me to Boston College. So I had finished my undergrad. I started at University of Oklahoma when I was training for the 1996 Olympics. And then I finished up at University of Houston. They had um, an extra two-year entrepreneurship program that I was really interested in. And so after that, it was one of the last classes that I took as that uh, from that entrepreneurship program was a business law class. And I had always had this idea that I wanted to start my own company. I wanted to start my own foundation. And I knew right away that if I was going to do that, I really needed to learn more about the legal system. And, and I was already, you know, at such a young age, I was already signing contracts. Yeah. And a lot of times I didn't know what they meant. <laughs> so I felt like, you know, I wasn't quite ready to jump out into the, the, the real world yet. So school was a, a comfort for me. And in law school, I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the LSAT and, and see where I land. And in uh, and Boston College was a great fit for me. Uh, big difference between uh, uh, the Boston, well, Massachusetts in general, and <laughs> Oklahoma, right? Yes, yeah, quite a bit of difference, but um, but it was great. It was fun for me to just kind of venture out on my own a little bit, and um, you know, do some do some new things. And I, of course, I was I'm one of those study study freaks. Um, I loved school, so for me, it was just nice to kind of have that comfort of of getting in the books. But I think by the third year, I was kind of ready. I'm like, okay. I'm ready to get out in the real world and do something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm done with the research. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But what is it like uh, to make an Olympic team and then to go to two different things and make it and then to go and compete? What is that like? How would you describe that? Well, you know, we always say as, as gymnasts, it's harder to make the team than it is to actually compete at the Olympics because the, um, you know, gymnastics in this country is is so incredibly difficult. Um, there's so many great athletes out there that just to make that team, whether it's, you know, six or seven, now, nowadays it's, it's five athletes on the team, but um, so just making it through the Olympic trials process <laughs> is such an achievement. And so then the Olympics kind of becomes the icing on the cake. You're now an Olympian, and anything you do after that is, is icing. But at the same time, you want to bring home medals for your country. That's what it's all about. You want to go out there, perform your very best. Um, so there's there's pressure that, you know, I think for me, I put pressure on myself. It wasn't really outward pressure. It was more, I just want to do a really good job. <laughs> I've trained these routines so many thousands of times. I just, I really want to hit it at the right time in the right place. Now you're married, uh, right? Yes. And was it? Did you have a big wedding, a small wedding? How would you describe it? <laughs> um, it was. Well, I guess it kind of depends on what your idea of, of a big wedding is. Um, we had about maybe about 300 people, but they were all very close friends and family. So my husband and I, we just um, we tried to narrow down the list as much as possible, but really make it uh, you know intimate for the people that we we know and love. Oh, uh, where did you meet your husband? I met him at a charity golf tournament uh, here in Jacksonville, Florida. I was um, up, still in school in Boston, but one summer I hadn't done the, the normal legal internships because I, that's not kind of the route that I was going to go. And so I was working still doing gymnastics commentary, hosting a show and whatnot during the summers. And, and then I was also 
doing these golf tournaments, a lot of charity golf tournaments. I think I was one of the few women that was um, women athletes that was kind of playing at the time and was able to play because I was retired. And so I got called down uh, to Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, and ended up meeting him there. Did not give him my information at all, but um, but no, he's just a really nice guy. Kind of tracked me down. We had coffee. We we talked for probably six months on the phone uh, before our, our first date. Um, but he's just he's a great guy. Now, you're quoted as saying, when you grow up on camera and in the public eye, you feel you have to put forth this image, and you say, I just took that to the extreme, and there was a lot of pressure on me. You mentioned pressure before. Talk about that pressure. Well, I think, um, you know, this idea um, developed in me that I just had to be perfect all of the time, and gymnastics is about perfection, and and I understood that. You, the closer you get to a 10.0, the closer you get to perfection, and, and that's the goal, and I was very goal-oriented, so, so the idea of perfection was something that clicked with me, and it it seemed to overflow into the rest of my life, and so I think um, that can be a dangerous thing because nobody's perfect. And so I kind of had to learn that it's okay to not be perfect. And in fact, I wasn't perfect in gymnastics. You know, I fell a lot before I got it right. And, and even my 1996 balance beam routine where I won Olympic gold, it wasn't perfect. I can tell you five things that I did wrong. <laughs> but I think it was just coming to terms with the idea that, um, you know, I didn't want to let people down. I wanted to be a good role model. Um, a lot of the, the people that were looking up to me were, were young children. They were kids. And so I wanted to be a good role model. And, and for a while, I thought that meant being perfect and never making a mistake. And then I realized, you know what? It's more about how you handle those mistakes than anything. So I, I had to kind of go through that, um, go through that in my own personal way <laughs> before reaching that decision. Now, in 1996, you did the rare thing of repeating as an Olympian and you kind of led the Magnificent Seven as it came to be known. Talk about that experience of now being an elder statesman among the other gymnasts, right? And having to lead them into this Olympics and of course the great results that happened. That's right, you can say old lady, it's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was very different. Um, you know, the 1992 Olympics were spectacular for me. Just the idea that I even made the team at 15 years old and after uh, an elbow, a severe elbow injury, um, I was just happy to be on the team and to walk away with medals was absolutely incredible. But four years later, all of a sudden, the expectations change. You're no longer the one that happened to make it on the team and happened to do well. You're now the one that's expected to lead the team and expected to, to do well and bring home that gold. And I had to really kind of calm myself down from there and just think about it in the same terms as I always had. Go out, give 100% every time. And that's my job. <laughs> and so I tried to really kind of um, separate myself from uh, from media and from you know as, as far as in my in my mind just the understanding that hey all i can do go out give 100 percent. i will train my hardest and i will leave it all on the field but um but that's that's all i can do that's all anyone can expect of me and um and i think just kind of talking myself through that and of course my mom helped immensely because she kind of talked me through that process and and it was just that realization that, okay, this is it. You've done the training. You've gone through the blood, sweat, and tears. Now you go out and have fun. <laughs> you just have to enjoy it. Who, who, you know, I've always wondered this. Who determines the routines you do? Uh, well, it's a combination between you and your coach because, um, obviously, um, you have to have a certain amount of elements and they have to be awarded a certain amount of credits. So you want to make sure that uh, the coach is on top of making sure you have the highest amount of difficulty. And then also what works for you. So if you're having a lot of trouble with one skill and it's in the optionals where you get to choose your routines, then then you might discard that skill and try something else. So you kind of work with your coach that process, but you try to get your routines down um, at least a year in advance so that you've got a year um, of preparation where you're training only that routine that you plan to compete at the Olympic Games. And then on top of that, you have to train plan B and plan and C because as we know, as athletes, anything can happen. You go up on the bar and all of a sudden, you know, something happens and you're facing the wrong way. Well, you have to know in a split second how to finish that routine and act like nothing happened. Yeah, I, I see the smiles all the time, and I, I, the smiles, the, the frozen hair, it's an amazing, yes. it's, it's one big show for me, so 
you are a cancer survivor, right? And in 2011, you were um, diagnosed with a malignant germ cell tumor, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And you had that removed, and then you went through months of chemotherapy. You're a cancer survivor and all that kind of wonderful stuff. Fantastic. You're cancer-free. What did you learn from that journey? Um, well, I learned so much. Uh, I learned a lot about myself. Um, I learned a lot about the strength, the inner strength that I had. You know, as a gymnast, I, I did feel... Um, confident when I stepped out on the floor, but off the field, off the competition floor, I was never that confident or um, didn't have a lot of self-esteem. And going through the cancer process gave me this realization that, hey, I can do things that I never imagined possible. And it gave me this different this renewed confidence, I guess, in everyday life and everything that I do. I mean, if you can beat cancer, then you, you can do anything. <laughs> and so it was just kind of that idea. But I think it also helped me kind of calm down as far as being so goal oriented. I am extremely goal oriented. Um, it's just it's how I move forward. And um, for me, a lot of times I would have great successes, but I would be so quick to, to get on to the next thing. Okay, What's the next thing I need to succeed at that I didn't really enjoy? Um, what I had just accomplished. And so now I think I, I do a better job of taking time to to have that balance to, you know, stop and smell the roses and just enjoy those successes and those small achievements along the way while continuing to go forth, you know, towards my other goals. Did you consider uh, being a part of the 2000 Olympics? I mean, you still would have been <laughs> a young woman, uh, maybe older in the world of gymnastics, but a young woman, did you think about that or no? I did, but it wasn't until very late. I was, uh, after 96, we went on tour um, for a little over a year. And, um, and that was a joy. I, mean, I loved going on tour because it was the opportunity to continue to do gymnastics, but in just a really fun and light setting. And, you know, you had 10 to 20,000 people screaming every night. It was, it was fabulous. But um, but then after that, I went back to school and I was I was finished. I was okay with, with retiring from gymnastics. And and then all of a sudden, in 1999, um, December of 99, I had um, returned from a trip to China with uh, the current team. I had gone over there as kind of a mentor, and um, and I just, as I watched the girls compete, it was just that that pull of, oh, I could, I could be out there. I think I could do that. And I was so out of shape, <laughs> and uh, nowhere near, um, you know, what, what a gymnast should be. And uh, and Jane. January, I went into my coach's office and, and I said, Steve, um, Steve Nuno was my coach, longtime coach. And I said, what do, you, what do you think about me trying for the 2000 Olympics? And he's looking at his watch and his calendar saying, OK, that's, you know, like eight months away. <laughs> um, we, we would have to get to work really quick. You know, how serious are you? And and we took a few months where all I did was conditioning and flexibility, no gymnastics whatsoever. I just had to get my body prepared. And so it was a very short span of time um, to get ready. But I felt like I felt like I could have been an asset to the team. And unfortunately, it ended with a, a vault injury. I um, I uh, it broke my knee. Um, on a vault during a qualification competition, unfortunately, and it just was not quite up to par. Um, I did go to trials, did well on, on bars and the other events, but vault, I re-injured it. So we just kind of decided, let's go with safety first. There's there's no reason to push it. And, um, and so that was kind of that, which was a little disappointing. But at the same time, if I look back, I do find a silver lining. I did get to be part of the tour again. And it was also also my first opportunity to be an analyst, to kind of go over to the broadcasting side. And, and now that's a lot of what I do. So um, so it kind of gave me, you know, when, when one door closes, a window might open. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, I think that's a, a key learning. And, and you did go out, which is unusual. You went out a champion. Most people don't go out a champion. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and I think... Um, it, and especially last year, I heard a lot about Nastia's comeback and Sean Johnson's comeback and why are they doing it and there's no need for them to do it. And But I understood it because it's not about the medals. It's about loving gymnastics. You know, when you love the sport of gymnastics and you just want to get out there and physically do the skills and challenge yourself with a new twist or a new flip, um, it, it's not about the accolades. It's just about getting out there and, and kind of having that freedom to do it because... 
it doesn't last long. You, you can't do that type of gymnastics um, as you get older. True. Now you wrote a an ebook, a free ebook, uh, I think titled "Competing with Cancer," right? And you would like for every viewer to get the book, to download the book. Just let me get that. I want to make sure I don't forget that. Where can they go to get the book to download the free ebook? Sure, sure. It's a competing with cancer, and you can get it on my website. It's shannonmillerlifestyle.com. Um, shannonmiller.com also gets you there. And and I just I wrote that more labor of love. Um, I learned so much from other women, other survivors, um, nurses, doctors. It's it's a whole new world, not only for the patient who's going through the cancer diagnosis, but for the family as well. The, the caretakers take on a huge responsibility. And so I wanted to kind of put together this, this book that, um, that would help others go through the same things that I was going through and that, that millions of, of, of women are going through. And, and I wanted to offer it free so that anyone would have um, the information just by a quick download. So that would be go to shannonmillerlifestyle.com. It's right there and you can find out all about you as well. So that's, that's I was to make sure I got that out there. I have something <laughs> that, that we discovered. You were inducted into the Boys Club All Sports Hall of Fame. How did you get into the Boys Club All Sports Hall of Fame? I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, I was pretty young. Um, no, I'm not really sure, but it was it was very much an honor and, um, and a great evening with a, a lot of wonderful people, and, and it's a great organization. So I'm very very honored. Now you have you in your after gymnastics life, or maybe you're also during gymnastics life. You have created your you lead Shannon Miller Lifestyle Health and Fitness for Women. What is that about? To kind of tell us that. Sure, sure. Um, the company launched in uh, July of 2010. I, I started working on it in early 2009. Um, my very last gymnastics tour was actually 2008. I was 30, getting in leotards, <laughs> riding a bus across the country with six 16-year-olds. And, um, and although they were wonderful, it was kind of one of those times where you realize, okay, I'm, I'm ready to move on. And um, we found out, uh, you know, we, we wanted to start a family, and we found out we were expecting in early um, in early 2009. And it was about that time that I had started writing a series of fitness books. And um, and I didn't really know what to do with them. It, again, it was kind of this labor of love, something I'd always wanted to do, but always had kind of put off. And I was writing the book on abs, perfect abs, <laughs> about the time I found out I was expecting. And um, I called up a friend and said, okay, I'm going to need photos right away because I'm not going to have abs much longer, and I'm not sure if they're ever going to come back. <laughs> and um, and I sat down with him, and, and he just said, you know, what, what are you doing with these books, and, and what is your vision? And I talked to him about the importance of health and fitness and wellness in my life and how I really – you know, I've been talking about health and fitness for years, but I, I haven't had it channeled anywhere. And, and so that's when he kind of, really, he really became my partner in this business. And we filmed um, prenatal and postnatal DVDs to help women um, during, you know, during fitness, uh, fitness during their pregnancy and afterwards, of course. And that just kind of snowballed into this whole idea of helping women make their health a priority. Because the more I travel the country, I do a lot of speaking, um, the more I spoke to women, the, the number one thing that I heard is I, I don't have time or or I feel guilty if I take that time for myself. And we've all heard, you know, our mothers and our sisters say that. You say, well, um, yeah, oh, I got Jimmy to the, the doctor and I got Susie to this and I nagged my husband. He's finally going to the doctor. <laughs> but but I don't, oh, I don't have time. It's okay. I'm, I feel fine. I've got work and I've got laundry and I've got cooking and cleaning and everything else comes first. And I wanted to help women understand that making their health a priority is not a selfish act. It's a very selfless act because frankly, if we're not taking care of ourselves, we can't be there for everyone else who needs us. Did you know this at the outset of your journey uh, into writing the books or has this come to you, as we talked earlier, has this come to you post the, the becoming cancer free in that whole process? Well, it, it started to evolve um, prior to my diagnosis, really just getting out there, talking to women. We, you know, initially the company was going to be called Shannon Miller Fitness. 
because I thought, oh, well, fitness is really kind of what, what I'm passionate about. And then as I spoke to, to my business partner, he he's a very smart man. And he said, you know, you're not really just talking about fitness. You're talking about a, a balanced lifestyle. You're talking about diet, everything in moderation. You're talking about wellness, getting to your doctor's appointments. You're talking about how we take care of our, our children and how, you know, how we handle stress and all of these other things. It's not fitness. It's a lifestyle. And, and so that's when we, we came up with, with the name. And it was about six months after launching the company when I was diagnosed. And I, I really credit having the company with being diagnosed at such an early stage because I had been talking to cancer survivors um, through um, September and October and the Cancer Awareness Months for um, for most of the women's cancers then then and um, and I almost skipped my exam that December I almost put it off and it was those voices those women the physicians i had interviewed and and i just felt such guilt <laughs> for being an advocate for women's health and, and even considering skipping my own exam so so i went in I, I called up and i just said okay give me the first available i'll, I'll make it work and that's when they found a baseball sized tumor so um so for me it was it was a, a huge um light bulb and from there it's just become such more so much more um of a passion of mine, just to, to really shout it from the roof, rooftops and, and help every woman, uh, young or old, understand that their health has to be a priority. Were you feeling ill prior to your uh, going in? You know, I really didn't think I was. Um, I had just had a post baby checkup um, about I mean, four or five weeks before, and so it just didn't feel like it was all that urgent. But my husband and I, we had decided we were going to try to expand our family a little bit more <laughs> with uh, with uh, baby number two. And so it was really just a checkup to go in and, and make sure everything was good, get my prenatal vitamins, all of that good stuff. And um, I really, I felt like I was fine. But looking back, you know, six months afterwards, I look back and I think, you know, and I talked to my husband about this and he said, yeah, you, you know, you, you were complaining about some stomach aches. And I had lost, uh, I lost like six pounds. And um, I, I just thought, well, I'm really busy. <laughs> I've got lots of things going on. My body was still changing because I, I had just finished nursing um, my first child. And so when things are out of whack, and I think when we don't pay attention to our bodies, and a lot of women, we just, oh, we're fine. You know, <laughs> if I have a stomach ache, you take some Pepto and you move on. You don't think it's cancer. Right. And so I think um, for me, getting the word out, of, particularly about ovarian cancer, but really all women's cancers, um, because a lot of them, the, the symptoms are um, so kind of general, you know, when bloating's a symptom, like, well, did I have too many Diet Cokes or do I have cancer? It, it's just a very difficult process. So I, I just want women to go in and, and get that those baseline tests and, and any tests and screenings that are available Let's utilize those. Oh, very good. Very helpful. Now, let me take it here. How tall are you? <laughs> uh, five <laughs> one, if I'm not wearing heels. Five. And does that make you one of the taller, or did it make you one of the taller gymnasts? Or I can never tell. Or what are the, the shorter <laughs> gymnasts? Um, I was pretty average. Uh, yeah, I was just kind of right in the middle. Um, shorter side would be you know, maybe four nine, four ten. Um, the tallest, like if you were watching television, you think of the really tall gymnasts. They're five four, so five, that gives four. you an indication of <laughs> tall in gymnastics. <laughs> wow, five four! My goodness. Okay, what? What? Okay, now, now we're gonna we're gonna dig a, even a little deeper. What would you say? Yeah, what would you say has been your um, the keys to your success in the sport? You've achieved monstrously in the sport. You've been, uh, as I told the folks in my office, I said the question is. Uh, is she you janet tv you were chosen certainly i think one of the five best of all time american gymnasts and said so she's one of the greatest to ever put on the put on the outfit so your success unquestioned how did you do it <laughs> um i think there's a lot of factors uh, obviously i think um the support that I've had, you know, my parents walked a very fine line between uh, making sure that they were as supportive as possible, but also allowed me to be a kid um, so that I didn't feel so overwhelmed by the process. It wasn't life or death, whether or not I won a competition, it was go out and do the very best you can, but yet we love you no matter what, and, and you still got chores to do when you get home.
So I think that that balance is really good. My coaches were amazing. Um, you know, they were, you know, kind of my second family in a way, uh, both Peggy Liddick, my balance beam coach, and, and Steve Nuno, uh, my longtime coach since I was eight years old. And they really taught me some really good life lessons. They taught me about goal setting and, and perseverance. And, and every time before I'd walk out onto the floor for, um, for competition, my coach, he would turn to me and he wouldn't say things like, well, let's go out and win a medal or oh, let's go get this. Or he would say, let's go have some fun. And he just always kept that mentality of, yes, this is serious because you're wearing red, white, and blue. And that means something, but this is about enjoying what you're doing as well. So let's go have some fun. Um, and I think the other thing was that I wasn't the most talented. I wasn't the strongest. I wasn't the most flexible. Um, so I think I, I really had to work for it. And when you have to work for something, I think it means a lot more and you do work a lot harder. Um, my coach always used to say that um, I was I was never the kid that would skimp on conditioning. I didn't like it, but if he asked me to do you know, 50 push-ups, I did 55. If he asked me to run 10 laps, I did 11. Whatever it was, I would just add a little bit more because I felt like I needed a little bit more to keep up with the other girls. And so um, so I think that helped as well, just that, that desire to achieve and, and kind of that, a bit of that scrappiness. Like, okay, I know I'm not the prettiest <laughs> out there on the floor. I know I'm not the strongest, but, but doggone it, I'm going to be the, the hardest worker out there. That is a lesson that uh, so many, I have kids a, a bit older than yours and the one that's coming, and that's a lesson that I try to teach them all the time, that uh, the one thing you can control is how hard you work, what you put into it. You can't control your height, your weight, your this, your that, your this, that, you know, you can't control all that, but there are things you can't control, and if we just focus on those things that we can't control, life can treat us pretty darn well. Absolutely. But let me add something I did not have here in my list of questions behind you. I see are those medals or what are those? Oh, <laughs> those are, um, this is, well, we moved from uh, my office used to be where my son is now. Uh, so, you know, with new baby coming, things are getting shifted. So this is my, my office at home, but those are um, Olympic pins. Wow. So I have a huge Olympic pin collection. So, so, those those are, those, awesome. so those are pins you get from countries you compete against, you trade pins. We trade pins, yeah. I've been actually trading since um, 19, well, since the 80s. My, my parents kind of got me started when, when I first went over to, um, uh, well, the, what was the Soviet Union. Um, I went over there for a clinic and learned about this, this pin trading. And so some of them are back as far as that. But, um, but yeah, every Olympic since then. Do you have a favorite pin? Oh... I really don't. There's so many. There's actually, there's one pin, and I'm not sure if it's up here on, on these or if it might be um, on another one, but um, there's one. It looks like a little metal. It's kind of um, rectangular at the, um, at the top, and um, it has a little little metal hanging off of it. And I received it uh, during that, that camp at the Soviet Union, and I, I received it for hardest worker. And for me that was just really special because I think I was maybe seven years old at the time. Um, could, it could have been six, no, maybe seven years old. And um, this was before I met my coach and really started training and um, just, you know, it was always amazing what the, what the Russian athletes could do. And, and what I found over there was, well, they just worked really hard and they still had fun and they laughed. And, um, and so coming back from that trip was when I really decided I wanted to, to be a gymnast. I wanted to, to really achieve something in the sport. And so just having that little medal that was hardest work or really meant something to me. Hardest work or a metaphor for everything that has gone on. When did you, uh, well, let me just think, what would you say have been the biggest challenge you faced in sports? Oh goodness, well, there's so many. <laughs> um, you know, I think, Injuries are always a huge challenge because no one wants to sit on the sidelines. If you're an athlete, it's the most painful thing to sit on the sidelines while everyone else is training and getting better and preparing for competition. So, um, so I think that's a huge challenge. For me, my, my biggest challenges were probably more from within um, frustration. 
was a huge challenge for me. And, and my coach worked with me for years on my frustration level, because if I couldn't get a skill right away, right off the bat, even though it might be the, the 14 year olds doing it and I was eight, <laughs> if I couldn't get that skill right away, I would just start crying. I would completely melt down. And it took a, took a while for him to help me understand that that's not productive, <laughs> that you really just need to take a deep breath, step back, listen to the correction, and keep working on it, that you're not gonna get these things overnight, but if you keep working on it, eventually you'll get there. And and so just that frustration within myself was was a, a bit of a barrier, certainly in the beginning. Wow, well, what's the number one? You know, we have many of the folks watching this are gonna be female athletes. Men are gonna be active women who are beyond their young competitive days. We have many CrossFit athletes. We have football players, we have judo, we have, but I know we're going to have a lot of young gymnasts. What would be the number one most important piece of advice you would give a young girl who wants to achieve at a high level in gymnastics and in other sports? You coming from you? I think um, for me, it would kind of comes in in three parts. But I would think number one would be goal setting. It really is. You have to have that long term goal. Um, my coach used to make us write down on an index card each year what our long term goal was, and in that year it might be to make the state competition. Or that year, it might be to make the 1996 Olympic team compete for the United States of America. But whatever that long-term goal is, you needed to plan to get to that goal. So what were those things that you had to do every day, every week, every month in order to get to that long-term goal? Because so many of us, we see um, that that long-term goal out there. but. Sometimes we procrastinate. We don't realize how the, the 50 sit-ups today really affects us 10 years down the road. Um, and, and a lot of times it is at least a decade in the making. So it's really important to set those goals along the way so you stay motivated. Um, the second piece of advice um, that I would give and that I got from my parents was to never set limits on yourself and to never allow others to put limits on you. I think a lot of times we think, well, I'm too short or I'm too tall, too big, too little. We always have a reason why we can't succeed. And we have to look for those reasons why we will succeed. And then the last thing I think is just have fun. You cannot lose the fun and the joy in what you're doing because the reason we do these sports is because we love it. So don't don't lose that that pure enjoyment. Very good, very good. Now you said uh, earlier when we were working with you that you realized you had special athletic talent in 1996 at the 1996 <laughs> Olympic Games, but you'd already been to the Olympics in 92. Explain that, how do you, how does that work? I, if you, this is your second Olympic Games, I would imagine you knew before then, but you said no. Um, you know, I, I guess because I, I've never really thought at one point in my career, you know, and I guess I chose 96 because it was kind of the end of my career. Um, there was never a point where I kind of sat back and thought, oh, wow, I, I've got a talent for this. It was always, oh, man, I've got to learn another skill to keep up with all these other girls. It was always striving for more and striving for better and striving for perfection. It was never just sitting back thinking about um, the things that I had learned. And, and maybe I should have done more of that and really kind of understood a little bit better um, how amazing it was that that I could do these different skills and, and compete at this level. But but for me, it was always about moving forward. And I think in some ways that helped me because um, I didn't kind of get that, that idea in my head that ooh, I was all that. It was just, okay, even though I won that gold medal, I've still got, you know, five things I knew I did wrong. So let's work on those. Um, it was it was just always the idea of, of perfection. I can tell you, there were routines where I got a 10.0, and I can still tell you the mistakes that I made. Well, you know, I've had the opportunity to uh, engage with many, many top athletes and performers in a lot of fields, and I've discovered that for some people, success satiates them. They're full, they're full, they're done. For others, it fuels them, it pushes them, and they're looking for, hey, I can do this better. Yeah, you say I did great, but I know I can do this even better. And I think that's what I'm hearing in you, which, again, would explain your amazing success. That's that's very well put. Yeah, that's very well put. I think, um, you know, the, the success that you have or success that I've had, it just, it really... Um, encourages me to to go further with it. Okay, well, if I was successful here, then what else could I do? Absolutely. Now, Little Birdie told us that as an athlete, 
uh, with, despite all your success, you always had perspective and that you, for you, your <laughs> academic performance was as important to you or very important and you were an amazing student. How did you, where does the perspective come from? How did you do it? Because most people lose perspective. <laughs> well, my parents kept me in line there. <laughs> um, as I said, my, my dad's, um, he's a physics professor and um, my mother, they both just always had, had let us know how important education was. And I had my sister, to look up to who is incredibly incredibly intelligent and always had the best grades and um and i usually got her teachers so <laughs> so i had to live up to that but um but education came first and and there was no mistake about that if if your grades slid then you didn't get to go to the gym because going to the gym was fun time and yes we we appreciate and understand that you're trying to compete at the olympic games but education comes first Sorry, and that was just understood from the very beginning. And um, it really helped me because I needed that balance. I couldn't be one of those those kids that, um, you know, ate, slept, slept and, and, and breathed gymnastics. I had to know that gymnastics was not life, that life was life. And, and I had chores at home. I had time with my family and, um, and, and education was going to last so much longer. Anything can happen in sports if I had an injury and and couldn't compete anymore. Well, what was I going to fall back on? My education. So that was something that was just always important and always um, uh, kind of the plan from the very beginning. And it gave me a little bit of a settled feel. I didn't feel as anxious about competing because I knew that um, there were other things in life going on. Now, where did you have your sweet 16 birthday party? Oh, goodness. You're going to ask me these things. I think all my parents know. I know I should know this because it was a really special one. <laughs> Celebration Station. Celebration Station. That's right. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and and what did you? Why Celebration Station? Looking back at it now, what what was going on with Celebration Station? I have no idea. Um, you know, I, birthdays. We you know we used to, we always celebrated birthdays, of course, but. Um, but it was just usually friends and, and family came over to the house and we played games and ate cake and, and whatever. So this special, um, the Sweet 16 one actually, um, some, some folks in, in our community kind of helped put it together because it was after the Olympics and it was just kind of an extra celebration. So it was just a really special day. And um, so we actually went somewhere <laughs> and had fun, but, um, but it's, yeah, it's a little bit of a blur. I think we had a slumber party. Um, there at Celebration Station or somewhere around there. But yeah, it was a long time ago. I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, I'll tell you, I remember uh, looking around me and after your your big event, your big accomplishment at the Olympics, suddenly little girls everywhere had the bangs and the braided <laughs> bun. And how did you feel about setting a, stri a, setting a, a style trainer? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I feel bad, but um, no. Hey, I I loved my white scrunchie. It was it was, and I actually I was we um we moved uh, a couple of years ago, and I found it, uh, and I pulled it out, and and that's still. I mean, I know you know some people joke about the big white scrunchies, but I loved my white scrunchie. It made me feel proud, and and it, it gave me that extra little you know glimmer when I walked out onto the floor. Um, so it was it's fun to see the you know the athletes that that was started wearing the, the big scrunchies and, and all of that. Of course, it's gotten a little bit more glamorous these days than it was back then. We barely knew how to put on makeup. They kind of put a little bit on us before we walked out for the Olympics, and and we just wipe it all off. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's it's pretty amazing when you hear kids and they're like, "Yeah, I used to dress up like you for Halloween," and and now they're now they're moms. Now they're moms. Now I, you know, speaking of hair and style and comments and people, this <laughs> most recent Olympics, uh, Gabby Douglas got a lot of commentary about her hair. What what are your thoughts about that? Um, well, you know, I, I I just think it's odd that people are talking about hair when when this young woman just won the Olympic Games. Uh, so it's, you know, it's just, it's like talking about the white scrunchie. And, and I know there was some commentary about um, who would wear a white scrunchie anymore these days. But, you know, I think it's it's part of it. It's, it's part of um, it, the fact that 
the Olympics is now a huge, huge social media event as well. Um, you don't have to wait for commentators to tell you what's going on because your neighbor next door is tweeting. And, um, you know, you've got Facebook and all of these different things going on that we didn't have back in 96. And so these athletes are also hearing more of that where we were a little bit more sheltered from from all of those comments back in the day. <laughs> so it's just learning how to deal with it and, and reminding yourself what's important. And, um, you know, it's it's unfortunate that that gets so much focus when her skills and her abilities and how far she'd come in the year prior um, maybe didn't, maybe got overshadowed a little bit. Right. What relaxes you as a, as a soon to be second time mother and a wife and all the stuff, your company you have and the travel and all the exposure, what relaxes you? <laughs> uh, not a whole lot. Um, yeah, we're, we're getting very close to uh, to uh, the arrival of baby girl. I, you know, I think what one of the things that relaxes me is looking at my son because, you know, you go through this 10 month process, as every woman knows it's 10 months. Um, and then, and then really, and after that, it's, it's nonstop. But when um, you've been through it before and I look at my son and I think, yeah, I was, I was sick during my pregnancy with him and had these issues and that issues, but I, just, I wouldn't trade it for the world um, for one of his hugs or, you know, just his little giggle. And so I think that just relaxes me to know that, okay, it's, it's going to be okay. We're going to get, we're going to get, you know, through the, the sleepless nights and all of that. And it's going to be great. But um, yeah, on a, on a more kind of realistic level, I read a ton. <laughs> that kind of gives me my alternate reality so I can just kind of zone out for a little bit. And I think it's really important. Um, like I said, it goes along with, with women's health. It's just taking that time, grab a cup of tea, go get your nails done, read a book, whatever that is, where you can just take a little time for yourself as well. What would be one of your, uh, your favorite books you've read? Oh goodness! Um, what have I been reading lately? Um, I don't know if I want to admit what I read. <laughs> <laughs> um, I read um, even like Lee Child, um, you know, just things like that. It's it's really it's mind candy, but <laughs> but it, but it just kind of gives me that little separate world where I'm just kind of can read for fun and not think too hard about it. Now you've had the tremendous successes and we've talked about it and you talked about frustration and injury. There's a lot of stuff. What would you say have been your um, most embarrassing moment as an athlete? <laughs> um, well, you know, I think being shy growing up, I thought every moment was pretty embarrassing. Um, come to realize there really weren't, they weren't really that embarrassing. Um, you know, for me, it probably hinged more on um, what I would do in competition, for example, the 1993 World Championships, where I went out and won the all around, and then a couple days later fell three times on one balance beam routine. That's pretty embarrassing <laughs> as an athlete. You should be able to stay on the beam. Um, at least, at least you shouldn't be falling three times. Um, so you know things like that that you just feel like you'll never live down, live down, and you want to crawl under a table afterwards. And um, so. Those are more the, the embarrassing moments for me. Okay, now you have, you know, as we bounce around here, you uh, have won a lot. You've had the embarrassing moments you just mentioned, things that frustrated you, a family that supported you, a family that kept you grounded, all, a sister that you aspired to stay up with. You've got a kid that keeps you kind of upbeat, a mm -hmm. husband who's there for you. What lessons did sports te teach you that you use to battle your ovarian cancer? Um, well, I think, um, again, I, I mean, and, and I'm, I hate to beat a dead horse, but but goal setting um, really was a huge factor. Um, you know, I, I don't want to leave out the, the importance of faith throughout my gymnastics career, my life, my battle with cancer. I mean, that was uh, the keystone, and that was really um, the number one, one thing that got me through all of it and continues to get me through each day. Um, but as far as lessons learned through gymnastics that helped me with you know, kind of in that battle, um, goal setting was a huge one, and and I had to adjust my goals. It was you know when we when I talk about um, exercise during chemotherapy, we're not talking about two hours of exercise. We're talking about if I could get up and walk around the dining room table, that was a really good day. 
So um, it's adjusting those goals, but also still having those, getting up and getting dressed. I could wake up, put my feet on the floor, change clothes. In, in, in many weeks, that was a good day. And so um, just learning how to kind of continue to take those baby steps forward was really important to me. Um, and I think also that the idea of having a team, having that support system, I don't know how anyone goes through a cancer diagnosis alone. I just, I don't know how that's possible. Um, you know, obviously my, my medical team, <laughs> my, my doctors, my nurses um, were absolutely incredible. But I, with, my, with my husband, um, my family, you know, they, they couldn't be there the whole time. They, they live in Oklahoma. But, you know, here he was dealing with um, a 15-month-old baby <laughs> and a wife who, you know, oftentimes um, couldn't get out of bed and doing laundry and running his company and, and trying to keep everyone's spirits up. And uh, many people don't know at the same time. Um, in fact, the day before I had surgery, his father had surgery for stage 4 colon cancer. And so dealing with that, and it, it was just so much. And so I think the caretaker's role is, is so critical in just keeping everything moving. And a lot of times they don't get the credit that they deserve. Wow, wow, my goodness, I guess. Well, that is, I feel like I should have your husband standing in the background for a little bit, right? <laughs> have him a question. But, but oh, that's okay. You know, I've got a series of questions here that as we're coming to the end, that I, special questions I ask each guest and then we have some questions from fans about you so i'm gonna get my questions first is that okay 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 first of all what is your favorite word <laughs> oh, these are gonna be horrible questions if you're gonna lock me in on something it's gonna change every day um oh. I, how much time do you have for me to think about that? That's a, that's, that's a deep question. Um, okay, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say love, but it may change tomorrow because it could be hope. Um, there's there's so many great words out there. Do you think your word would change based on situation or just because you have so many words you like? Would the situation um, change you? Probably a little bit of both. Yeah, it could change um, for, uh, depending on the situation, but it could also change just, just because there are so many amazing words out there that you could use. Okay, all right, fair enough. If you could compete in gymnastics against any athlete in your prime, who would it be? Um, and that's a difficult question because in my career, I never thought about competing against another athlete. It was always me against the equipment. It's always me to try to get the very best score because there's nothing really head to head about gymnastics. But um, I, as far as competing with, um, I think it would have been fun to you know to put together a competition where it was really kind of like all the the best athletes, you know, the the Kathy Rigby's and the Mary Lee Rettons and um, yeah, the Latinas and, and and all of all of um, the great athletes, the the Komanichas and um, kind of get everyone together. Just, Kind of an all-star competition. That'd be fun. <laughs> a face of kind of MMA for gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite song? Um, <laughs> actually, um, there's well, there's one my son sings that I absolutely love, <laughs> but um, it, it's just the the um, I love Rocco song. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And so he sings it. I'm, I, do, you know, I, I will not be singing this on camera. We do not need that to go. Okay, out. okay. But yes, it's a, it's a, it's a little, um, it's a song my son um, and uh, and his daddy made up, and it's the I Love Rocco song. Yeah. So, this is, so this is a song made up uh, by father and son? Yes. Wow, yes. very nice. <laughs> there could be an album in this. We'll see. So That's right. <laughs> if heaven exists, what might God say about gymnasts? <laughs> um, hopefully he would say that, um, well, I, well, I don't know about gymnasts in particular. Um, hopefully he'll say that, that we worked really hard, but, um, but as far as me individually, I, I hope he would say, I'm, I'm glad she had faith in me. Well, nice. We just welcome aboard, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what, uh, one big thing, gigantic thing now, uh, as you stand at this stage of your life, what big thing that you want to share has life taught you? Um, it's full of surprises. You just never know what's going to happen next. Fair enough. Uh, 
Now, I know that you're promoting women's health, and so I'm going to ask this question. What, how might Janet TV help you promote women's health? Anything in particular? Um, well, you know, certainly um, love for women to go to ShannonMillerLifestyle.com because we do have um, a lot of free programs and um, articles and information on women's health and everything from losing that last five pounds to how to handle a cancer diagnosis or, or diabetes or heart disease. And so a lot of the big things, uh, mom and baby, that, that sort of thing. Um, we have great programs as far as, you know, walking programs and whatnot. But, um, you know, I think the biggest thing that anyone can do, whether it's a company or whether it's an individual, is just keep talking about it. Keep talking about it. Um, help women understand that it's it's not selfish <laughs> to take care of themselves. It's something that they have to put on their list just like they do brushing their teeth and eating breakfast and put that on your list of making your health a priority. Now I'm going to let you speak with your fans. So here are some questions from viewers. So from Barb in Cincinnati, what do you miss about being a gymnast? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, I, I miss the family feel because um, the, gymnastics is the gymnastics community is pretty small. So you do feel like a family. Um, I'm very lucky in that I still get to have that in many ways. Um, because I do continue to work with USA Gymnastics and help promote the sport. I get to still do the, the commentary and that sort of thing. Um, but I think the biggest thing I miss about it is just the, the physical aspect of gymnastics, the, the flying through the air, the twists and the turns and the challenge of learning a new skill. I, I can close my eyes and still feel those moves, but my body could never do it. <laughs> not, not these days. <laughs> All right. Not from Steve in Maryland, will you encourage your daughter or your son to compete as gymnast? Uh, well, my son's been in gymnastics since he was 15 months old, um, and a lot of people are surprised by that, but we're talking, you know, the, the parent and top classes. Um, he wasn't walking at 15 months, and I thought, well, he's probably just never seen a, a child his age walk. <laughs> so um, so I took him to classes, and within two lessons, he was walking. Um, but I think it's, it's such a great sport for balance and strength and coordination and body awareness that will help him with any sport that he decides to go into. Um, um, he loves swimming. He loves t-ball. He loves to run around and and play. So um, I just want him to have that that base, and then I want him to decide uh, what he's passionate about. What I want for my kids are for them to find something. I want them to have some type of physical activity, and I want them to find something that they're as passionate about as I was with gymnastics. Okay. All right. From Cat in Utah, this is the final question. From Cat in Utah. Which of your many awards is most meaningful to you? <laughs> um, well, my son's the most meaningful award, but as far as like gymnastics medals and whatnot, um, it, it, that's it's almost too hard to decide. I, I would think, you know, I actually, uh, I would say one that a lot of people don't really know about, and that was um, when I won the all around gold at a competition, one of my first junior international competitions. I think it was the second competition where I got to put on the red, white, and blue. It was in Catania, Italy. And I finally stayed on all four events. And at the end of the night, my name was atop the leaderboard for the first time ever. I'd never won anything nationally, much less internationally. And um, it was the first time that I got to hear the national anthem being played and see the American flag being raised. And I knew at that moment, that this is this is it. This is all I want to do. And I want to do it on the biggest stage possible. And that's when I decided my goal was the Olympic Games. Gold at the Olympic Games. Wow. Wow. Well, goodness. Well, Shannon, you've been fabulous. <laughs> and uh, is there anything that I have not asked you or not that, <laughs> that you want me to ask you or, or do? Um, I don't think so. I think you covered a lot. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. And continued success with your pregnancy and your family and Shannon Miller lifestyle. I appreciate that. Thank you very much.